left after we're getting done. Maybe they'll have some. We'll see. But uh, just thank you so much. Sixth grade guys showed up today to cook all the burgers and get it ready. Chris Owens, we did the beans. Give a big hand. Yeah. because he won the rib contest in October here, oh, right. September. He did. He did. And so he wants to come back next year to see if uh, we have a chance to win the trophy from Georgia back to Texas. Uh, so we need to try to up our game a little bit. So let me pray for us, and then we'll just kind of help yourselves at the table. It's just burgers and beans. My wife said, oh, Lord, you're having beans tonight? And I said, yeah, a whole room full of guys are eating beans. So I think we're going to be like a Russian fire plant here pretty soon. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you so much for Jesus who reconciles us to you. Thank you for our food and fellowship and just our smiles and laughter. Thank you for burgers and beans. Father, we ask that our time this evening will be glorifying and honor to you, and we lift it up to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 For the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and invite our speaker to come up tonight. Uh, we had budgeted our men's dinner uh, to be from 6 to 7.30. But because Paul will be starting speaking a little sooner than we had planned, we'll be able to get out of here probably about a few minutes earlier. Now, Paul's going to share with us about applying the gospel to the different stages of manhood. And so I'm so thankful to see so many different stages of manhood here tonight. And uh, I'm going to open up our time in a word of prayer and pass over to Paul. He's come here from Macon, Georgia. And we did ministry together years ago. I think I've been five or six years now. But he's just a great speaker. I'm so thankful that you could join us tonight. I'm so thankful you're here. Well, let's pray and pass it over to Paul, and then I've got a couple of announcements at the end, and we'll be done. Father God, I thank you so much for Jesus and our time together. We ask that you would open our hearts and ears to hear the message you have for us this evening. Lord, help us to be drawn closer to one another as brothers in Christ as we're drawn closer to you, Lord. And we just uh, thank, thank you for Paul being here from Georgia. And we ask that our time continue to be glorifying and honoring to you. Let's give Pastor Paul a big hand. Thank you, Paul.
And I believe that the answer is that same thing in reverse. If we would be godly men, godly husbands, godly fathers, godly brothers, godly sons, that we could literally, with the help of Almighty God, this nation could be turned around and turned upside down in our lifetime. And some of you fellows have a lot more road in the rear view mirror than you do in the windshield. In your lifetime, it can happen, but we've got to make some changes. You agree with me? Yes, sir. Amen. So I want to talk to you tonight by stages and ages. Because I believe that God speaks to men generally, but I think he also has a particular word for each of us at our life stage. And I believe that tonight I want to share with you something that is not information, but hopefully will be transformation. And I know we're still eating, uh, but I want you to help me with this. Uh, I want all of the young men in here tonight, if you are age 18 and under, if you're 18 and under, I just want you to stand right where you are. Go ahead, stand right up. 18 and under. Let, let's, let's honor the young men among us. And if you would turn and face me and remain standing, let me talk to you guys for just a minute. Um, in, in the scriptures, in Luke chapter 2, verse 51 and 52, it's a really interesting uh, historical account when Jesus was 12 years old. And uh, he, he, everybody went back to hometown, and Jesus hangs out in Jerusalem. And his parents couldn't find him. I remember when my wife taught this to the kids' Sunday school class. You know, first time these kids have heard, the, heard that account, and, and one of the little boys said, they had to go all the way back to Jerusalem. And they found him two days later in the temple. And one of the little boys raised his hand and said, Ooh, I met him, got a spank. <laughs> yeah, but here is Jesus was 12 years old. And, and the scriptures say this after this happened. He had, he had an interaction with his parents. And the Bible says this in verse 51. Then he went down with them and he came to Nazareth. Nazareth. And he was in submission to them. Submission. Jesus understands what it's like to be your age. Jesus was 12. Jesus was 14. He was 17. He knows what it's like to have your voice crack, your beard sort of come in, and girls to be both, both interesting and terrifying all at the same time. <laughs> he, he understands. He gets where he's walked. He's walked where you're walking. But he went down from, from Jerusalem, the Bible says, to them, and he was submissive to them. That's God's word for you in this life stage. Submission. Now, you've been sold a bill of goods, and, and you have been lying. You have been told that because you're a teenager, you're supposed to rebel against your parents. I have five sons and three daughters. <coughs> I looked every one of them in the eye, especially my boys, and I said to them, culture says you're supposed to rebel against me. Bad idea. You're not supposed to rebel. And I know I was 13. Jesus was 13. I thought my parents were stupid. They're not. It's amazing when I got in my 20s and had my own how smart my stupid parents became quickly. And it's the same thing that's gonna happen. Your parents aren't dumb and they're out there, they're looking out for you. And if you if you have both a mother and a father in your home, you have something that so many of your fears. And if you got a mom and a dad who love Jesus in your home, you are in a, such a very small village <coughs> tonight. You ought to be so grateful and so thankful. And I want you to think about this. This blew me away when I looked at this. Jesus was submissive to Mary and Joseph. Was Jesus perfect? Did he ever sin? Were Mary and Joseph perfect? Nope. But listen to this. Think about it. If Jesus, the perfect son of God, could submit to imperfect parents, you being imperfect can submit to imperfect parents. If Jesus, the son of God, was able to submit 
And if he needed an imperfect parent, guess what? So do you. So do you. You need your parents. And you need to submit. That means you need to give in. It means you need to do what they say. And you need to be submissive to both parents, not just one. I know how you guys are. You will ask the one who you know is going to say yes. And in our house, that was mom. That was mom. Mom, mom would always say yes. But you need to be submissive to both your parents. And I challenge you guys. On the way home tonight, you come with dad or you get home talking about asking. Am I submissive to you? I, I, I led a men's conference last weekend. And one of my sons was with me. And as soon as, the, as soon as it was over, he came over to me and said, Dad, am I submissive to you? And I was honest with him. How did, how did Jesus pull it off? And don't buy into the cop out, well, he was God, so it was easy for him. No, that don't work. Jesus was submissive to his mom and dad by the wisdom of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the same way that you can be submissive. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. And the only way to have the power of the Holy Spirit is for you to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Not in name only, but a true follower of Jesus. And have the power of the Holy Spirit on your life. To be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Because here's the truth. The entire culture, and you guys know this, the entire culture out there is a fool's parade of idiots. You each know a hundred idiots that ought to be here tonight. Don't you? I, I, I see Chandler shaking his head. <laughs> yeah, you do. That's the world that you guys have to live in. Instead of being out there and doing things that matter and learning from the godly men in this room, young men are wasting all their time on pornography, video games, and stupidity. I'm not anti-video games. Now my son's a disagree with that statement. But I'm really not. <coughs> but when that when that becomes the driving force, motivator, and a thing that is always at the forefront of your mind, that is not good. Because what you're doing when you're playing, and I like it, certain ones, I like it. And you know what we're doing? We're practicing dominion. See, God called every man to take dominion over the world around him. But here's the problem, though: the dominion you're taking is a fake. It's a faith because at the end of the day, you might have the high score. You might win the level. But what have you really gained? That energy that you put into that, God intended <coughs> to exercise in the actual real world. I give my sons areas of dominion. Sam is 13. His area of dominion is firewood and trash. <laughs> in that order. He shot me a picture. I homeschooled him. I'm actually his teacher this year. We were in a hybrid school. He was working on Latin. He got done with Latin. I was, I was out golfing and he's texting me a picture. And he, had a, he had a four foot section of a hickory stump that he had worked on for three hours and finally split it. He had to send me a picture of that. You know, you know why Sam couldn't wait to get out and get done with Latin and go out there and, chop, and split that stump? It's dominion. Guys, Nathan, you're made for dominion. You, God made you to take control over and to manage and to subdue an area of creation. Don't waste your time on fake dominion. Get out there and, and, and invest your life. The future that, that belongs to your peers today is neither plotted nor planned and it does not leave the life of flourishing. And there's a whole, there's a whole industry out there that's trying to suck you guys in and take your money. And it's designed uh, and defined by saying that you are designed and defined by what you consume, not by what you produce. Did you hear that? What you consume, not by what you produce. They are all about consumption and not production. If you're not careful, you'll become a taker and not a giver. You've got to submit, and it's not easy. It's not easy. I'll say one more thing, and I'll let you sit down. When I was about, any, anybody in here, 14, 14, 13, 14, 15? Raise your hands, sorry. I think I was 15, because right before I got my driver's license, I 
Apple devices. Um, I grew up in Connecticut, and my dad, we heated our home really cold up there. We heated our house with a cold furnace. And uh, earlier that summer, the neighbor lady's tobacco barn fell down, and it was an old barn. My, our house I grew up in was built in the 1700s before Connecticut was even a state, it was just a colony. That tobacco farm was a couple hundred years old, fell down. And so my dad volunteered us to go clean it up. And we took that wood, it was super brittle because it was old, and you could break it just with a sledgehammer, and it was like fat leather. You know those fat leather, it's a piece of wood you throw in, you light the wood, and it lights the cold furnace on fire. So one evening after supper, we went downstairs, and it uh, was my job to cut up those barn boards so Dad could start the cold furnace. And I had a log down there that I would put it against and I'd come down with that sledgehammer and when I did that board would come flying back and I'd duck out of the way. I put my other board up there. My pop said, son, if you will move that board so that it meets the edge of that log, it will not fly back towards your face. What's your word, guys? Really? What's your word? It starts with an S. I want to hear you say it. Submit. I'll give you a hint. Ready? Did he say sin? <laughs> All right. <laughs> we got one honest one in a bunch, right? <laughs> the same way. What's your word, guys? Oh, that's beautiful. We are men. What is your word? <laughs> now, to submit to my dad would be to stop what I was doing. Go move that board to the edge. I wasn't very good at submission. <laughs> and, I, and I wanted to disobey. But here's, here's my thought process. You know what? I'm going to try that on the next one. And I came down with that sledgehammer, and that board came back towards my face. Only it came back so fast, I couldn't get out of the way. The only thing I could do was to turn my head so I didn't. It's just a natural instinct. Those barn boards were put together with old iron nails. We call them square nails. Well, they were all through that wood. When I turned my head, that chunk of wood, at a very high rate of speed, entered my nose on this side and poked out the other side. And literally, I turned to look at my father, and the board was swinging and squeaking. <coughs> and it's hanging through my nose, through my nose. And my father had these words for me. There you go, dummy. <laughs> That's what he said. And I panicked, and I ripped it out of my nose, and I destroyed all the cartilage in my nose by doing that. Ended up having that surgery, put a plastic, I don't have cartilage, I got plastic. I pick my nose now, you can feel it says baby Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> my word was submission. All I had to do was listen to the guy. And I taught my sons as a result of that. Obedience is this is the definition of obedience. I do exactly what I'm told right away, and I do it with a joyful heart. If one of those three things is missing, I'm not submissive, I'm not obeying. And it cost my dad a lot of money, and it cost me. Oh, oh, that really hurts. I do not recommend it. What's your word, man? Submissive. All right, here's what I want to happen. It's important that we do that with this group of men more than any other group in this room tonight. I should do something. Let's pray for these young men to understand. So here's what I want you to do. I mean, we're godly men. Let's just get around these guys. Y'all just get up, go around, and put a hand on these guys, and let's pray, and then I'm going to pray in a minute. Everybody gather around these young men right where you are, and let's pray a prayer of blessing on them, that God would give them a spirit to submit to the authorities in their life. <coughs>
as these men continue their prayers over these young men. We just speak blessing, these well words over these young men. I pray that, that uh, you would, through the power of the Holy Spirit, give them the ability, the desire to come under the authority, willingly and to choice, to come under the authority of their parents. Uh, I pray to give them a boldness and wake them up to the incredible future you call them to as a man. I pray that you do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can take your seat. <coughs> Real quick. All right, the next group of guys. The next group of guys. Here's your stage in life. If you're, if you're 18 to 39, stand up. 18 to 39. I'm not going to make you stay stand. I just want to look at you for a minute. 18 to 39. I thought there'd be more. Enjoy it. It doesn't last. <laughs> All right, you guys can have a seat, but I want you, I want to hold your attention for a minute. Uh, now I got I got I read this whole book, and I, I got some bad news for those guys that were just standing. Those young men. The Bible doesn't have anything good to say about young men. Well, actually, that's not true. It does say that the Bible does say that they're strong, but. So are pit bulls and food poisoning. Uh, and and I don't, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, but, the, but the scriptures do say that young men have a lot of strength. Now, a lot of times young men lack wisdom, but they have strength. So 18 to 39. But here's the thing. Young men that were just standing, I want you to understand something. The entire culture that you live in today Hear me, is designed to destroy you, to demean you, to emasculate you. Yes? Yeah. yeah, pretty much. Anyone heard about the Gillette commercial that just came out? Gillette! Who shaves every day? Oh, I think that's an arcan. The, the razor company is telling you that if you're a man who understands who he is and the, the true man after the biblical mandate, your masculinity is toxic. I've heard they want the commercials that toxic masculinity. The culture does not love you. The culture is not out for your flourishing or your success. When you go to college, these guys are <coughs> from Unica, you will not find a, a, a men's study department. There's no national organization for men. And it's so bad in our in our country today that did you know that for the first time ever in the history of our country that there are more young women than young men in the workforce in the, or in the church? More young ladies your age in the workforce than there are young men. In the church, it's even worse. There, the young women of this age group out. Strip the young men by 10 million just in our country. There's a whole group of God <coughs> Christian young women who, who cannot find Christian young men to marry with which to have a Christian marriage. I'm looking at some of you guys as you just stood up. Those numbers work in your favor, and you should thank Jesus for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm not going to be dishonest, <laughs> What are you guys supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be, supposed to be out there serving, but instead, they're living on their phone, downloading pornography, playing fantasy football, video games, and playing the pool. There's a veritable mountain of pornography on the internet. But there's very little instruction on there about how to become qualified to take a wife and be a man who speaks life, serves, and causes the people around him to flourish. You won't find that on the internet. I, did you know that today there are more young women in the United States, this will be away, with driver's licenses than there are young men? Is that crazy? 
they're more, they're more young women driving than young guys because these guys are, 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 are going back home and living with their parents. There's a whole term for this called boomerang, the boomerang generation. And I tell my kids all the time, I love you, don't come home. <laughs> I take my wife out every Monday evening. I take her out on a date. We have eight children. And yes, I know what causes that. I have a license to practice, and practice makes perfect. <coughs> but I take her on a date every Monday night. Every kid, the youngest is four, the oldest 29. Every kid at some point figures it out. Well, they're going out. Why can't I go? Just the other day, my youngest, he finally said, I asked him, hey, I want to go. And I got down on one knee, and I put little Jack's face in my hands. And I said, son, I love you, but you ain't going. <laughs> and what do you think he <coughs> What do you think he asked? Why? Favorite word. I think it's the first thing he ever learned to say. Why? And I said, there's a really good reason, son, and here's why. I'm raising you to leave, and I'm dating her, so she stays when you do. <laughs> <laughs> right? Just being honest with him. I'm dating her so that when you leave and it's just her and I, she still likes me. Because I have no idea how to do laundry, cook, or any of those things, and I will just die without her. But did you know that today, in, in the world that you young men live in, 40% of babies, if they're fortunate enough to be born, are born to young women who are not married. 40%. Forty percent of those kids go to bed at night. Forty percent of all the children in the United States of America go to bed at night without a father in the home. It's a problem. It's a generational epidemic. I call it. I call them boys who can men who can shake. Boys who can shake. They're boys emotionally and spiritually, but anatomically and physically, they're men. They're boys who can shake. And and they want a a boy's responsibility with all the privileges of being a man. <coughs> Have you seen this? And it's a, it's a problem in the church today. And there's a whole there's a whole segment of society out there who is trying to market that to you. And they tell you that you're a man if you drink this beer. Drive this truck or eat this meat. And they're filling a void and they're taking your money. It's all about consumption and it's not about production. And how do we change that? Look around this room for guys with either no hair or gray hair and watch them. Learn from them. And then we have the, the problem of the, of the father wound. And that's epidemic. Either they had no father, you get this, especially this generation, they grew up with either no father or a bad father. And, and they've been wounded. And that usually produces two types of men, and I've seen them both. A guy that's either too tough or too tender. The too tough guy, he's a thuggish, brutish um, abuser. And he gets his way by being that alpha male who intimidates everybody. And then the other end of that spectrum, and I'm seeing more of this today than we ever used to, is a guy that's too tender. He's a really nice guy who gets run over and taken advantage of. And if he ever does find a wife and have children, they will be unprovided for and unprotected. Both of these things are, are a tragedy. Jesus himself, he was tough and he was tender, depending on the circumstance and who he was talking to. There's a place for both of these. Your word from God today comes from 1 Corinthians 13. And it's in verse 11, and here's what it says. When I was a child, Paul said, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, listen to this, I put away what? Childish things. I put away childish things. What is a boy in You guys tell me, talk to me. When some of you gray heads 
out there. When, when did you know you were a man? Seriously. Louder. I'm really half deaf. Well, Uncle Sam told me that one. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly right. I thought people said, well, you know, it's just hopeless. There's no way to make a man out of a boy. I said, you want to bet the military does it in six weeks all the time. Yep. When Uncle Sam told you, you went into that a boy, but I guarantee you, you came out of that a man. The boy died in boot camp, and the man served the rest of his time. Yeah, what else? How? Well, someone else, when did you know you were a man? Hair on your face. Hair on your face. Start paying taxes. Start paying taxes. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I hear that. I got my first real job. Got my first real job. So that's a real job. Yes. <laughs> One with responsibility. There you go. Uh -huh. There you go. Yeah. Uh, how do we know when we're men anymore? I got real concerned about that when my oldest boy started to come up. Because in the world I grew up in, you know, we, we hung our manhood hat on our, our first illicit sexual encounter the first time we got drunk. And I really wasn't okay with my guys hanging their manhood hat on that. I didn't want that to be their experience. I said, there's got to be something better. And I began to read and research, and I found out there is something better. We have no more rites of passage, except boot camp. We have no more rites of passage. We've lost those things in our culture. But when my boys turned 13, my three older boys, I sent out into the world a month ahead. I called all the men that had anything to do with their life as an effect, a positive effect. We live in Georgia now. We went out hog hunting and killed, killed a couple of big hogs and cooked them all day long and shot guns while they were cooking. When that was over, we ate, we feasted together, and we sat around a bonfire, and every man wrote a letter to my son, giving him some piece of advice because he was no longer a boy, but he was becoming a man that night. And we you know what interested me about that? You know, you know who, to a man, the guys that could not get through their letter. And I don't mean a tear trip with them. I mean these guys lost it with the old men. My hunting partner, Ken Goins, 78 years old. Here's what he said to my son. He said, Paul Jr., I fought in Vietnam. I held my best friend in my arms while he died. I've done all the stuff that men do. But I would literally give my right arm to have my father do for me what your father's doing for you tonight. The most amazing thing about that, Ken doesn't even know Jesus yet. He all pray for him. And his son, he walked a little taller when that was over. When that, when that, those guys got done reading, we gathered around about before that happened. He, he came and he got, he got one of his toys. What's the Bible saying? When I became a man, I did what? Put, my put away. Toys. By the way, that's God's word for this. <coughs> we need to be putting some things away. He brought his favorite toy. It was a little pop gun made out of wood. And he played that thing for hours. He brought that to me, handed it to me. I broke it in two and threw it in the fire. And I said, Your childhood is done. And I put my hands on him and I blessed him in Jesus' name. I said, you are my son. You belong to me. And I could not be happier about that. I love you more than I would take a bullet for you and not even think about it. And God has got incredible things planned for your life. And I bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to our world. He ceased being a boy at that moment. And when I said amen, he was a man. We got to regain that. And you young men that stood up, you got some stuff you got to put away. And it starts with your thinking. You know the difference between the way a man thinks and a child thinks? A child thinks someone ought to serve me. A man thinks I ought to serve someone. child thinks that someone should take care of me. And a man says, I should take care of someone. 
Real men step up. They don't step back. God called you to put away childish thinking. I'm, I'm going to say this. Let's be honest with you. I think there's an entire generation of young men out there today who have been over mother and under father. Moms have done a great job, but it's incomplete without a strong father in that home. My wife and I have an understanding. God has called her to comfort the afflicted. He's called me to afflict the comfort. <laughs> and in there is a wonderful balance <laughs> where the kids know they're secure, but they better not cross that line because dad's coming home. We need to know our roles and what it is that we're supposed to be doing as men. There are some things that need to be put away. Guys, what do you need to put away? Some of you need to put away your porn habit. Some of you need to put away your regular and over drinking. Some of you need to put away your running away from any and all responsibility. Some of you need to unplug the Xbox, put some pants on, move out of mom and dad's basement and join the real world. Quiet in this Episcopal <coughs> church. I'm just telling you the truth. Don't you start messing <coughs> God, I just want to say this. You're in your power years, man. Your 20s and 30s, your power years. You are, you have strength, and that's just physical. You're ready to attack life. Don't waste that on stuff that doesn't matter. On fake dreams. On fake realities. Get out there and exercise your God-given dominion. And by the way, I just want to give you a little life lesson here. Nobody follows a big one. Nobody. Oh, I had a terrible father, and I had a terrible life, and just things just nobody calls a victim. Forgive your father. Make peace with your past. Be a victor. That's the kind of men that people follow. You're in your power years. Don't give it up. Let me pray for you guys. Father, in Jesus' name, bless these young men. First group are our sons, and the second group are our brothers. Bless them, Lord. I pray that, that you will, right now, in Jesus' name, you will, you will bring to their mind everything that needs to be put away that belongs in childhood, not in adulthood. And I pray that all around this room, Holy Spirit, that you will be speaking very specifically into men's life. I pray that this group of young men that just stood that they would never run away from responsibility, but run towards it. Never say, oh, I have too much on me, but rather look for something else to take on. Because, Father, you made us men like trucks. We drive straight when we're carrying a load. And I pray that you would, Father God, load up these young men with responsibility, that they might walk a straight path before you in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you're 40 to 59, stand up. Slowly, I don't want you to pull anything. <laughs> 40 years old, see, they're already hurt. To 59. Now, the young men are sons, the, the last guys were brothers. You guys are fathers, even if you're not a father. And by fathers, I mean you are the life givers in the community, you are the providers. You guys matter more than you can ever, ever know. You guys can be seated, but, but let me hold your attention for just a moment. We had a family function recently. Thankfully, I wasn't part of this conversation. But one of the family members of a bunch of us were the ladies talking. And a mama said to her 18-year-old daughter, tell them what I told you, taught you about men. And here's what she said. <coughs> men are selfish and men are stupid. I'm like, really? That's going to set her up for success, boy. <laughs> then I got thinking about it. Men are selfish and men are stupid. <laughs> they really are. And she's saying that from experience. Now, that's the wrong thing to tell your daughter. But she's making a point. But I want to tell you something. God's word for you is found in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 7. And Paul starts that off by saying, my beloved children. That's fatherly. My beloved children. We have many teachers in Christ, but you have not many fathers. You don't have many fathers. 
And fathers are life givers. Paul would later on, he would, he would call uh, Timothy and Titus and Onesimus his sons in the faith. Right? And, and then Paul would go on to say in this passage of Scripture, look, look, I'm, I'm your father in the faith. And then he said this, you ready for this guy? Imitate me. That's God's word for you. Imitate me. And I want to ask you guys to understand your question. And I'm, I'm in your group. I'm asking you this. Are you imitatable? Your son grew up turn into the men that you are today, would this world be better off? Or would they be in trouble? What about this church? What if all the young men of this church looked up to you and said, I'm going to be I'm gonna be just like him. I'm going to be just like Harry. Would this be a better church? Or would there be more positions to fill? Are you in the table? I'm, I'm going to make sure this church would double in size. Listen to me, guys. And then we're going to talk about this one last group. This church would double in size almost overnight. If those guys that were just standing, those fathers, would operate in the fathers, the spirit of father. If you became life givers who actually just didn't come to church but found these young guys, put your hands on them and learned to bless them and pray for them. <coughs> and you were guys that would spend time with young guys to come to church. Every young man in Nacogdoches is desperately looking for someone, a godly man, who can tell them what it means to be a man and be a life giving to speak life into your community. You guys would explode, and Nacogdoches would change forever. I believe that with all my heart. And by the way, if you, if you stood just a minute ago and you love the Lord Jesus Christ and you've been faithful to your wife, and you've got a Bible that's all beat up, you are a unicorn. You are a rare bird. And this culture, this church, Nacogdoches, Texas, desperately needs you. You wield far more power than you can ever, ever imagine, guys. God has got great things. You are in the power years of your influence. You live long enough to be over Fool's Hill. I might be glad you're over that hill. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you. I am. And let's pray for these men. Not the young men. You guys are just in the court of scripture. They just call you men. Father, I pray for the men that were standing just a moment ago. Would you bless them? Would you give them your father heart for this church and for their world? Would you speak into their lives so that they might speak into the lives of, of starting with the men in, this, in their family and the men in this room. And I pray that these guys, if they're not right now, that they would make a front burner issue in their life, that they would become imitatable before the end of this year. And Lord, if there is some stuff in their life that just really they would say, oh, I, man, I sure don't want my son to be doing that or involved in that or get messed up that. And God, I pray that you would reveal that to them right now. And I pray that you would give them a whole distaste for whatever that is. That it would, it would be gravel in their mouth. They would turn away from their sin and become men who are imitatable. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, last group. You know who you are. 60 and above. 60 and above. I think there's going to be a big group of guys. Yeah, 60 and fans. above. Is here. Well, look around. Look around. By the way, you young guys that have stood up first, you look at the... They made it. <laughs> they made Let's give these guys, let's honor these elderly old guys and women. Give them a hand. Oh, that is fantastic. You can be seated slowly. <laughs> I want to say this. We do not live in a culture that honors old men. By honoring old men, we honor all men. The best way to make a man honorable is to honor him. Years ago, I read this account of a, a, a lady.
lady that just had it up to her eyeballs with her husband, and she said, that sounds dumb, dumb. She went to see a lawyer. She said, I want to divorce my husband. I don't just want to divorce him, I want to destroy him. And I'm not just financially, I mean emotionally. I want to bring him to his knees. The lawyer said, I'm going to pay exactly what you want. He said, you go home, and for the next month, you just praise him to the hilt, and you tell him what an amazing guy he is, and, and all this stuff. Just, just lift him up, and just, just keep all kinds of praise on him. And then at the end of that month, serve him with the divorce papers. You'll never see it coming. It'll destroy him. At the end of that month, she never came in. The lawyer called her. Hey, I, how, how'd that go? Did you, did you serve him the papers? What was his reaction? She said, you're out of your mind. Serve him the papers? He became the man I was telling him he was, and our marriage has never been better. The quickest way to make a man honorable is to honor him. We honor you guys tonight. The world does not. You are the brunt of every joke on TV and in the movies. And I want to tell you what, God sees you very, very differently. You are in a very strategic place in your life today. Your word from the Lord, your life stage, comes from the life of John, the beloved apostle. Remember John? He was actually the youngest disciple. He was probably about 16 years old. People don't realize how young he was when he followed Christ. Just a kid. <coughs> but he lived longer than any of the others. Obviously, he started out younger. But they say that John lived into his early 100s. Now, when he was a young man, he was a pretty <coughs> salty guy. Do you remember him? He went through this one time, and the town didn't want to listen to the message, and John said, Jesus, I'll tell you exactly what to do. Call fire down from heaven and burn them all up. You remember that? Just burn them up. The hell with them. They don't want to listen up. And he was also arrogant. He said, you know, he said, Jesus, now I know you, you know, you're going to bring this kingdom in. I heard there's a throne. And uh, I want to sit, I don't want the big throne, but I want to sit on the throne right next to you and rule all the kingdoms of the world. Uh, I don't want the big one. You're welcome. But I want to sit on that one right next to you on your right hand. Pretty arrogant guy. He, he, was, he was a hothead. And yet, church history tells us that when John was an old man, couldn't walk, 100 years old, that they would take him around to these churches. They didn't have wheelchairs, but they, they would carry him in a chair and set him in the front of these congregations. And he would say things like this out of 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. My dear little children. That's grandfather speaking about it. My dear little children, don't sin. Don't sin. And if you do sin, well, know this. We've got an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What happened to a hothead that, that sent him all to hell? What happened was he got the heart of God. He learned the love. He, he was overwhelmed and overcome with the love of God. You go and read his, his, his latter epistle, first second from first John. It's the love of God. And he just oozed the love of God. God absolutely changed him. <coughs> As he gets older, he gets more love. Dear little children. How many, by the way, you got, how many of us have grandkids? I have three. What a good deal they are. My daughter came to me almost a year ago. said, Dad, can, can I ask you a favor? I'm like, yeah, what do you mean? Can I have my baby in your house? Can you, can you what? Yeah, I want to have my baby in your house. See, they, have, they literally live out in the woods. No lie, like in the woods in the middle of nowhere. She wanted to have a home birth, but she needed to be close to the hospital. What, you can't say no. And so I said, no. I think so. He goes, oh, by the way, it's a water bird. I said, of course it is. <laughs> Bring me in the pool, you know. 
And she had, she had my grandson in my dining room. And I was out actually speaking at a conference. And man, as soon as that conference was over, I went home. I never seen a granddad. I've never seen one in my own home. You know, go, where do you go to see your grandkid? In a hospital, right? Like normal people. I walked into my own house, sat in my chair, which looks very much like a throne. <laughs> Just does. My son-in-law walked over and handed this little baby to me. <coughs> you guys know that one? I didn't know. My little dear I mean, my heart just melted. I could have died right here just been very happy. That's, guys, I want all of you fellows to look right here. I'm almost done. That's what God the Father thinks of you. He, God, looks at you the way us older men look at our grandchildren. It's the father heart of God. It's that legacy of love. And by the way, you'll never leave a legacy unless you live a legacy. I learned that from a wonderful organization. I'm so glad to be a part of in my early ministry called Promise Keepers. Radically changed my life. Matter of fact, it was at a Promise Keepers event 18 years ago in Charlotte, North Carolina. <coughs> my dad had uh, done some foolish things. He had, he had gotten caught up in some sin and couldn't seem to find his way out of it. My oldest brother and I decided we would, we would take a chance. He was running from the Lord. That we would take a chance, buy him both a promise keeper's ticket and a round trip flight. And all he could say, all he could do is waste our money and say no. He wanted to say no, but he's such a skin flint and he's so tight he could not bear to see us lose that investment. And so we came. <laughs> Long story short, God got a hold of his heart the very first night. He got on his face before God and he repented. We had the most glorious three days. The entire three days, I would, or two days, I was trying to work up the nerve to ask my father to bless me. A biblical blessing. I just felt it was something, from what I tell you earlier, every 28 days a young woman is powerfully reminded that she's a woman. A, a young man doesn't know he's a man until his, what? Father tells him he is. He's 33 years old. Thank you. I needed that. Yeah, I didn't know. Anyway, I could I could not work up the nerve to ask him the question. We sang uh, <coughs> how great thou art at the end, 49,000 men. To get that many guys together, we actually sound good. <laughs> and when they said amen, it was like the Daytona 500 in that parking lot. I mean, it's crazy. 49,000 guys racing out of there. And I was walking back with one of my elders in the church, and I was almost in tears. And not because of the music, but because I can't believe I blew this. And there's my dad walking away with my brother on the side of the park. I, 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 I reached in my pocket, I grabbed the keys, and I threw them to the head elder. I said, Jim, start the van up, turn on the AC, and wait for me. And I went running across that parking lot. It's kind of like you got to be old to know this, but it was like a video game Frogger. Somehow I made it, but it was close. <laughs> And I run up on my dad and my older brother told him, and, and, and I said, Dad, he turned around. And I said, Dad, I want you to bless me. And he had a puzzled look on his face. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, I want you to put your hand on me. A biblical blessing involves physical touch. And I want you to tell me that I belong to you you're proud of me, that you love me, and I want you to release me to the calling of God on my life. I said, son, run businesses, you're, you're a pastor of a church. I said, dad, none of that matters. You're the only one that can do this for me. I need you to do this. And all of a sudden I heard a voice behind me, my brother Tony goes, yeah, dad, I need you to do that for me too. So there we are. 
in the parking lot, cars going around us. One hand on me, my brother Tony's very tall. One hand on Tony. <laughs> Here's my little short Polish father. The tears flowing down his face. And he, he blessed us in that parking lot. And I'm going to tell you guys, I am never going to say it. It changed the course of my father will probably die while I'm in Texas. And a really hard decision to make because he's hour by hour. He will not last but a few more days. <coughs> and I went, I went down to see him. He lives just down the street from me at home in hospice. And before I left, I went down to see my dad in hospital for the last time. Extremely weak and very tall. I called him up. I said, hey, Pop. I said, uh, I'm headed out of town. I wanted to come see you before I left. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Texas. I'm going to challenge a group of men to be men. You know, receive God's word for where they are in their life. I said, I have to be about our father's business. When I said that, he smiled. His eyes were still closed. He smiled. And he said, that's what we raised you to do. I said, God, can I pray for you? He said, yeah, I pray for my dad. When I said amen, the very feeble hand came out from underneath those blankets and rested on my head. And he blessed me before I left his house. That old dying man blessed me. I come to you knowing who I am and why I'm here. I am blessed with my father. And every man in this room can give that blessing to every man in your life. And it will make the most incredible difference that you could ever make. I close with this, the words of John F. Kennedy. Do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger. church that we're having it in 
everything that we talk about, it sounds like sports because there's some sports figures, but it's all about Jesus. And uh, I was on Focus on the Family last week, and Dr. Dobson blessed, uh, blessed me with, he said, I think this could be the next promise keepers for us. And I sure hope that the Lord blesses the men that come. That's all it's about. It's not about money or making anything. It's just about bringing men to Christ. Our focus now is on 20 to 50 year old men. Men that don't know Jesus or men that know Jesus but maybe need to grow in that faith. We welcome everybody. But that's the program is targeted after. We have a year long curriculum that goes after it with videos and things like that. But the whole program is to try to bring men to Christ. And I would really like to ask that you pray for the event. You pray for the speakers, you pray for the men that would go there. And I'd ask that you pray every day between now and March 3rd. Thank you. Amen. Last thing I just want to share with you is a good part of being men is to be protectors, right? To protect our families at home, but also to protect our church family. And Robert Cuban Jr. has done a great job of stepping up and putting together a group of guys we call the Eyes and Ears team, whose role it is is to protect our church family on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings and also whenever there's special events. And the more guys that he has who can step forward and wear an earpiece and just walk around and be present, the less that the guys have to take away from being with their families and sitting in the worship service. These guys serve very faithfully and probably stay on. Sunday morning, sitting on the couches or driving the golf carts. I'm so thankful for Robert's commitment to this and uh, just his willingness to do this every, every week. But if we had more guys sign up, then maybe they'd only have to sign up for themselves about once a quarter or maybe twice a year. But if you're here tonight, you're interested in being part of an eyes and ears team, which is simply having an earpiece and watching for anyone who might be suspicious or look, look like they could cause trouble. Or God forbid something does go down in our church, these guys are going to be the first responders and we'll be taking instruction from them. But if you're interested in that, you can talk with Robert. Robert, raise your hand. Robert's just been so instrumental in this, and I'm just so thankful for you, Robert, for all that you're doing. But please, I'd encourage you to sign up. And, and it's just a matter of being present on a Sunday morning, maybe having an earpiece or walking, talking, driving a golf cart. But it'd be so neat if the guys in the church took shifts, and it could be as matters once or twice a week, three times a year, if everybody signed up. I hope to talk with Robin about that way you here tonight. Let's close out in prayer. And Paul, Paul, come on up here. I'll pray for you. And Joe, can you come up? Let's pray for your event. And pray for your dad. He's <laughs> back. No, I'll be crying. Oh, my God, that was on. Awesome. <clears throat> Father God, we just thank you so much for Jesus, who is the great comforter. He is the Prince of Peace. He is our Lord, and he is our Savior. Father, thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross in our place, and you took your wrath and poured it out upon Jesus. And you took our sin and you nailed it to the cross of Christ. Amen. And that all we have to do is simply believe and we are saved. Amen. Thank you for Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection, and for the hope that we too have in the resurrection from the dead. Lord, I lift up Paul's father to you this evening, and I just ask that as he transitions into your presence, because we know he knows you, that you will give him peace and comfort, and give him joy. As his family is present without Paul there, this morning, uh, preparing to mourn the loss of their father and grandfather and husband, I ask that you will give them peace and comfort and joy. Let Paul not be anxious, but let him, let him rest comfortably in the sovereign hand of a God who loves him so much. Thank you that Paul can be present tonight just to pour out his heart and uh, show us a little bit of the ministry that you called him to do. Father, we lift up Joe to you as well, just our brother in Christ. Father, Jesus reconciles us to you, but he also gives us the ability to be brothers with one another. And we lift up this man's ministry that you called him to, and we just pray a tremendous blessing on it. That fruit will just fall from this tree, spiritual fruit like I've never seen before. That these men would just speak that truth and love and their hearts would be convicted and they would turn to you. Help this ministry reach lost men and continue to put a fire in the men's ministries in so many churches around this country. Lord, help all these slots of 2,500 churches be filled quickly and let the number exceed that just in a way that 
Joe would just be so giddy as he sees how you move. And Lord, for these men who are here tonight, Lord, I ask for a blessing upon them as they leave their families and their businesses and their homes. And Father, as they go tonight, please take them home safely and let us all continue to be drawn closer together as brothers in Christ as we're drawn closer to your Son, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here. If you could just help pick up around your table. And